It is Jim Johnson, the head coach at Contractor Coach Pro and your host here on Contractor Radio. And uh, I got a really cool guest today. This is exciting for me because this is one of those um, sideline passions that I have. It's one of those things that as I've grown more and more as an entrepreneur, leader, coach, it's an area where I really focus a lot in my own life. And this is this mental side of what we do. Uh, really this mental performance aspect of what we do. And uh, Ryan reached out to me a couple weeks ago and said, hey, I do this mental performance coaching. And it, it was super exciting. I'm like, man, I would love to talk to a mental performance coach. And so we're going to be talking to a guy that we're going to take a little bit of the sports psychology world and we're going to apply it to the sport of entrepreneurialism this sport of running a business, this competition that we're all in, and how to get our head right about all of it. Um, he's got a master's in sport and exercise uh, phys- psychology, and he owns Perseverance Performance. Welcome to the show, Ryan Tigan. Good to have you on board, man. Thanks for having me, Jim. I really appreciate it. Now, now Ryan, uh, you're up in Wisconsin, right? Yes. Yep. Is, is it a little chilly? Yeah, you know, the weather's been very up and down. Um, <laughs> it was 80 degrees here a couple of weeks ago, but it's been sitting probably in the 40s for a while. So pretty typical hey, Wisconsin weather at this point, but it, it's getting better from here. <laughs> yeah, I lived in Wisconsin for 18 years, and this was the time where it was the most fr- – like when May 1st hits and it's still cold, I'm 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 out. I don't want to do that anymore. Uh, so uh, I moved <laughs> back to Texas. It's always awesome to interview somebody from Wisconsin because uh, the people of Wisconsin are my favorite people I've ever run into. Uh, they're very genuine. They're very authentic. Um, they're very family oriented. They're very town oriented. Do you see that as, as a, a Wisconsinite? Oh yeah. I mean, I've lived here for about seven years now. Um, and you know, I've kind of dug into the community aspect for sure. I mean, all of my friends, they have their own stereotypes and they have their own, you know, kind of mini culture, just depending on where they're from, whether it's Sheboygan or Milwaukee or Kenosha you know, there's something about it and they have, just have their own atmosphere. And it, it's very interesting just to note the differences. <laughs> just yeah, if you, if, people, just if you ever feel the need that you got to go to a dive bar, just go to Wisconsin. You'll find them everywhere. They're all over the place. So, uh, <laughs> it can be a fairly good time on a Sunday for a Packers game. Uh, but without uh, going too much into Wisconsin, let's talk about you a little bit today, Ryan. Um, you're You're a... Um, mental performance coach. Why that? Like, what? Why did you pick that? Where? What's the background? Give us the the history a little bit, and and why you're doing what you're doing today. Yeah. So I think my journey has been one of um, self exploration, and what I really mean by that, it, it's not the destination itself, and it's not necessarily the journey that you go on, but it's who you become along the way. So when I say that, you know, I first went into college, my undergrad years, um, thinking I was going to become a physical therapist and just be a college athlete on the side with track and cross country. And the reality was, was that was so much harder of a goal that I had necessarily, that I didn't necessarily think about, you know, going in as, you know, an 18 year old kid driving midway across the country to go to school for something that I was not really sure that I wanted to join and trying to be a college athlete on top of that was, you know, you're juggling a lot of hats there. You're juggling a lot, whether it's practice schedules, competition, just getting homework done and getting studying for exams. All of that was, you know, two part-time jobs on top of each other, even two full-time jobs, if you really think about it. And my first year, I really struggled with um, just some physiological stuff that was going on. I had an iron deficiency for quite a while and just general burnout that was associated with it. And I was sidelined from running for probably about four months where I couldn't run at all. Um, every run just turned into me being really sick and um, just being really sick and you know not being able to make it past like a mile without just being fully out of breath. You know, and I three months before I was doing eight to 10 miles, you know, waking up and just going do that before breakfast. Um, 
which was probably, most of you, probably most part of it. Were, <laughs> most people are not up for that. Uh, eight to 10 miles before breakfast. Sounds like the military. Yeah. <laughs> it, it almost was at some points. But uh, when I was sidelined, you know, it really got me thinking about what my future career, just in terms of an athlete and just in terms of my career trajectory, what that was going to look like. So as I was doing that, I really started to dig into sports psychology and I read a couple of books, um, one of them by Jim Affermero, The Athlete's Mind or The Champion's Mind, um, How Great Athletes Think and Thrive. Um, that was probably the one that had the most influence on me. And from there, I really started to dig into my own psychology as, you know, both an athlete, as a person, you know, what was it that I really needed to work on? And when I took a good look in the mirror of what I wanted to work on was necessarily my confidence and just learning how to stay present when things are going rough during, you know, a cross country race or during a 5k or a 10k on the track. Cause that's a grind. And the more that I learned what that grind felt like and how to kind of dig into that dark space, I think that changed the trajectory of my career as an athlete quite a bit. And I love that. I love the, you know, just learning how to dig into my own psychology and the mental training aspect and just learning how to be a better athlete, but also just being a better person and just, you know, taking those life skills that I learned and essentially putting them into my own spikes and, you know, my uniform. Um, and that's really what I do now. Um, you know, I, I kind of changed my undergrad from pre-physical therapy more into the, the psychology space where I was doing exercise science on top of psychology. And then from there, I wanted to keep going. And that really started me on this journey of sports psychology. So I recently just graduated back in September um, after finishing up my internship hours and really just digging into performance psychology and exercise psychology in general. That's a pretty awesome story. It's, I, I have a question. So iron deficiency, uh, making you feel yes. bad. I know when you're low iron, you're like low energy and all that other good stuff that goes along with that. Um, why digging into the mental and psychological aspect of it and not the nutrition or did you? I did. I, I did. And I had a, um, you know, I was seeing an oncologist at the time and she was fantastic. And I, you know, I had full faith in her, but I think at the time I was looking towards the end of the cycle, right? I was looking at what it was going to look like when I came back from essentially an injury, right? My body wasn't working the same way that I was supposed to. And I think that's what really started to push me in that uh, trajectory in the sense of, am I going to be able to get back to the same level of training that I was at without having this happen again? Um, and obviously with the physiology and just the medical side of things, things are being taken care of, but it was more of kind of a, a mental gut check of, do I have what it takes to keep being an athlete mentally as well as physically, you know, without having a, um, necessarily a doctor holding my hand every day while I'm out there on the field or out on the track or things like that. Yeah. I, I love that term gut check. And I think it applies whether you're an athlete or you're an entrepreneur, like you're constantly having these, do I have what it takes to actually turn this thing into a business and then a growing business and then this thing that's vehicle that helps me achieve some freedom? And there's constant gut checks throughout all that time, especially when you have setbacks. And that's what it sounds like uh, you went through. You had the setback uh, with the iron deficiency, and then you're going to come back from it, and you're going, will my body stand up to it? Do I really want to do all this hard work? Um, is the effort worth it? So you start studying the mind aspect of it. What did you learn about that? And then did it have an effect? Like, did you come back? Did you work harder? Did you do better? Like, what, what happened? Yeah. So if you look behind me, there's this uh, ship picture that I have in my background, right? And there's a quote that I heard um, from Grace Mary Hopper. She was a big part of the Navy back in the 1940s. She's one of the mothers of computer science. Fantastic person. But she's quoted in saying a ship in the harbor is safe, but that's not where a ship belongs. And I think that really embellishes a lot of what I do as a mental performance coach and what I've learned over the, the last few years of how to help athletes. Because we can do a one-on-one -on -one session and idealize everything that's going to go right, everything that we're, is going to be perfect. You know, I, I did it on my own in terms of like 
you know, I'm going to come back. I'm going to have this great PR. I'm going to have these great track sessions. You know, all these great workouts are going to make me run three minutes faster. Cool. What is that work in between going to look like? And when I was kind of going through my own work, you know, I, I really started to dig into the confidence and what that confidence string really looked like. And for me, it was just learning how to journal, just journaling the process, right? What are some things that I did well during the week? What are things that I didn't do well? What are things I need to work on setting goals that are going to help me push towards those long-term goals that I had for myself as an athlete. And from there, you know, if I didn't have the ability like running, if I didn't have the ability to run, you know, I was trying to do more imagery training than anything of just trying to put myself out there, you know, on a cross country course on the track and just trying to really embellish and get the most realistic image that I could in my head of what it actually felt like running. Cause the research shows that when we visualize, when we're practicing imagery training, it's absolutely better than nothing. Right. So if you're like today, if it's, you know, 35 degrees and raining and that's not your work environment, that's not where you want to get out there to contract or go for a run, but you want to make sure that you're building your confidence or just sustaining your motivation. Just taking a few minutes to practice that really just digging in and just making this realistic picture in your head, just practicing what it feels like to be back out there, you know, even in sports or just, with your contract work that you're doing. We, we actually do this in, in our sales training. We talk about this, um, you know, as we approach a home, uh, you, you have kind of two parts. You have the initial introduction, then you do some type of in, inspection, then you do a presentation. And so after the inspection, we coach our, our uh, sales athletes is what we call them, um, that when they're in the vehicle, the last thing they do before they go in the house and I got this coaching a long time ago is to visualize the process exactly how it goes and visualize the success at the end. And, and what that leads to is giving you confidence. Like you've run through it once. Anytime we've run through something once already, the second time is easier. Third time is even easier. Fourth time is even easier. And it just starts to build this uh, confidence because now we're competent. And is that something that you've seen throughout this? Yeah, absolutely. It sustains your motivation, right? If if you feel like you need that to keep going, right? Because we can set goals. We can set some of the biggest goals of our entire life. But if you don't have the motivation or the drive to keep those goals sustaining, you're not going to achieve them, right? And if you don't know what you're doing, you're not going to be able to achieve those goals too. So even just practicing building that competency is huge for your motivation. And learning how to do it on your own is just going to push it even further. So you, so you mentioned something earlier um, that you, you were visualizing what practice was going to look like. What you were going to set personal records, what running again was going to look like. And that stuff started to build your confidence a little bit. And then you were at the end of that, you said, well, what is the stuff like, what does it look like before that? And so that sounds to me like process or discipline. Can you explain more about that? Yeah. I mean, it, when I guess in my in terms of what I was doing, I, I was doing a lot of cycling while I was just kind of sidelined because I you know I couldn't run, I couldn't put any real weight on my body without um, you know, really feeling it, and that was totally fine. Um, but while I was doing that, I would just close my eyes and just put myself you know out on the road, out at a cross country course somewhere. Sometimes I would look at you know actual photos of whatever course we we're going to be on you know, throughout the season, just look at those before I really started, you know, my practice of really just getting on the bike for an hour at a time and then just close my eyes and just embellish that, just live it, just learn what it felt like to run on that course, you know, kind of learning the turns just mentally in my head um, or even just getting on the track. You know, if I was pushing myself on the bike, just closing my eyes and thinking about what it meant to be in that dark space you know, thinking about what thoughts I might have if I was pushing myself really hard and learning how to accept that. You and I talked a little bit about acceptance right before we kind of went live and what that looked like when we acknowledged that sometimes our inner dialogue is, is messy or noisy and it doesn't like us. But the reality is we can 
put it in a box and we can just build this mental distance on it, which is something I work with with athletes all the time, especially on the endurance end. Um, you know, if you think about where you are when you hit the wall in a marathon or at the end of a 10 K sometimes your, your self dialogue isn't that nice to you. And sometimes it does take a coach to help you and kind of take a step back and say, is this dialogue helping me towards my goals or is it just pushing me back? That is powerful. Uh, the people that are listening or watching on YouTube, this um, internal dialogue that we have with ourselves, um, human behavior studies tell us that we are going to lean towards the negative. Is that is that a fair statement? I just want to ask the guy with the masters. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think some people always wonder why. And I think for a lot of people, it's a defense mechanism. Right. But that's where the sense of getting out of your comfort zone really comes in is that when you're stretching yourself outside of that, that voice is just going to get louder. And with mental training, you can learn how to accept that volume and just build and keep going. So when you say a defense mechanism, what do you mean by that? So I, I you know, I've got a hurdle, whatever it may be. I'm, I'm hurt in athletics or, um, you know, mistakes keep being made in my business and we've got drama happening and stuff like, like you start to defeat yourself with these things you're saying, and maybe I'm just not good enough leader. Maybe I don't have uh, the right processes and I, maybe I don't have the tools. Maybe I have a bad brand, maybe like all that stuff on a business or entrepreneurial side. Both apply. Like it, it seems like they apply very cleanly. And so we start saying these things. Are you saying to lean into them and be mindful of what they are so that you can then disarm them? Yes. Yes. I, I think physically what's happening is when we, when that internal dialogue starts, sometimes it's a script. And sometimes that script is, you know, something we've been telling ourselves for a long time. And the reality is, it, I mean, if you think about it just in terms of sports, right, that voice is trying to make sure you don't get injured. For people in the business world, it might be so they, they don't get rejected, that they don't have those feelings of guilt. So they're really holding themselves back or limiting themselves so that they don't have that necessarily that pain that they feel on the other side in case things go wrong. Well, in sport, if you think about that, if you acknowledge that the, that wall is there, that hurdle is there, and you still just keep pushing forward, even if it's just with curiosity, that's when we get into those states of flow where we really just start to dig into it and say, you know what, the other side isn't actually that bad. Or the other side just looks like the same side that I'm on right now. So it's just learned, that's really stretching your limits, it, you know, in the most real sense that I can, that I can tell you. Yeah. The, the, the word you use there that I think uh, should really sit and like resonate with the folks that are listening is the word curiosity. Don't look at it as a, even a positive or a negative, just a curiosity. Like, okay, why, why is this thing holding me back? Why am I thinking what I'm thinking? Why am I allowing this to get in the way? And, and there's a great book about this actually, like the, the power of why and asking the question why three to five times usually we'll dig into where the root of it is coming from. Did you do any studies along that of like that curiosity aspect, asking why getting clarity on it of this is why. So now it's easier to overcome. I would say it was more of self exploration and that's okay. what I encourage most of my athletes to do is just when they find themselves in that dark space, whether it's a long run or whether it's, you know, some type of workout that they're doing, just ask themselves what's going on instead of checking out, just check in harder and, and really just think about what it means to be present and accepting what's going on in that moment. And then just realize why you're there in the first place. Yeah. Cause I think most of the time you hear whenever you feel that coming, positive affirmation, right? Like get, get rid of the negativity to get that out of your world and go to the positivity, start picturing yourself winning the race or a personal record or all that other stuff. But if I'm understanding you correctly, like dig into the dark place work first and get the control of that before you start to do the, the positive side. Yeah. Yeah. Or really just learning what you can control in that dark space. And sometimes it's just, being there, being present, 
and just acknowledging that you're there in the first place. And that can be, you know, even while you're working. I know contractors work long hours. Some days they just have that impulse to get up and go home. Just sit with that, you know, just take a couple of minutes, sit with that and just really dig into it and say, okay, what is this feeling or this thought that, or the script that I'm telling myself that's making me feel this way? Well, that was really good. Why do I want to check out right now? So in, yeah. in a lot of the world out there for these guys, they're running appointments. They may even be knocking doors, which is always uncomfortable. Um, they may be on a project that they're not thrilled about. And so, you know, quitting time is five, but they're leaving at 4.30 or four o'clock is, hey, I got to go to Home Depot and pick something up. They really don't. They're making all these excuses of why they don't want to be there. Digging into why that's happening, I think is like, that's great advice. Um, yeah. what, what's telling you to stop right now? Is it just this mental script that you're telling yourself that the next one's going to be even worse or that type of thing? Or is it something that's more deeply rooted? What do you find? Like, is it something pretty surface or is it something deeply rooted from when they were younger? You know, I think just in, in my capacity of a mental performance coach, I, I can't dig necessarily too much into, you know, their childhood trauma and things like that. So everything I do is still performance based and, what I find with them is most of the time it's their own voice. It's not somebody that they had in the past, or it might just be a coach. Um, you know, it might've been something that it might've been a memory that just really stuck with them, whether it was, you know, a meet or a practice where a coach just told them something and they just bought into that logic. And just because that logic served them at that time, doesn't mean it's serving them in the moment that I'm working with them. Right. It's not helpful. So it's learning how to people react differently. Yes. Uh, People. So, for example, I can remember this Um, back in high school, uh, played basketball, baseball and all this. Uh, I played sports quite a bit. And uh, I had a coach and uh, we had these two guys that played on our basketball team. They're twin brothers. um, And he always called them gumshoe because it looked like they were running with gum on their shoes. They were slow. Right. They just weren't fast. And uh, I met them years later, and that stuck with them. Like, they, they always just decided they were slow. But there was another kid that he did that to as well that uh, ended up becoming one of the fastest kids in our school. And at the time, they were pretty equal. But the one, it drove. The other, they let it determine. Do you, mm-hmm. Can you talk about any of that? Yeah, I, I think that... You know, that really just depends on their relationship with the coach, too. You know, oh, how somebody they buys in. Yeah, how they buy in, how much rapport they have built with them. Because if somebody that I have as a coach tells me something and I've bought into their program, they mean a lot to me as a person and as a mentor, you know, I'm going to listen. I'm going to add some more weight to what they have to say. But if I have a coach that's just kind of there, he's doing it for a paycheck and I don't have a great relationship with them, they tell me to do something. But my instincts or my history of training tells me to do something else, you know, I'm just going to brush it off. And sometimes I work with that with athletes of saying, do you have that relationship with the coach still? Do you still talk to that person? Right. And if they say no, you know, I might tell them, hey, let's think about rewriting that script or acknowledging that that script was helpful at some point in your career, but that's not who you are now as a person or as an athlete. Yeah. It, and I, I comment on this quite a bit whenever I'm coaching. Um, and I, and I set the expectation too, like anybody that works with us as a client that um, I'm not here to be your friend. It's not my job. My job mm-hmm. is to provide you with the tools, the fundamentals, the skills and strategies to achieve your fullest potential. And if I love you enough, I'll be hard on you when it's time to be hard on you, but I'll also high five you when you do something well. And uh, that kind of gets it off to the right tone, I think. Uh, how, how, what do you think of that approach? Is it, is it a worthy approach or should I do something differently? I think that's good. You know, um, there was one study long, long time ago in just terms of therapeutic alliances and coaching and what really makes behavior change happen. And a third of it is just a relationship. So obviously building that rapport and that relationship with the people that we work with is, you know, that's a third of the battle. 
But at the same time, we can't put ourselves in their shoes at the time, all the time. We can be empathetic, right? But I tell athletes that at the end of the day, I'm trying to coach myself out of a job with them. And in terms of I'm going to build the skills, and I think that's what you're alluding to, is I'm going to teach you the skills to apply in your own life, in your own practice, so that I, you know, at the end of the day, if you're racing, I don't have to tell you anything. I'm just going to sit back and watch. If if I do it right, you're going to fire me one day because you're going to yes. need either somebody better than me because you've achieved goals far beyond what you ever thought, or you've achieved what you need and you don't need me anymore. That, that's my perfect situation. So you say, uh, you said a third of behavior changes relationship. What's the other two thirds? The actual work that we're putting in, right? The actual techniques, whether it is imagery, confidence building, even just practicing staying present, you know, that that's huge for people or even breath work, learning how to take a deep breath and just building that in, listening to your body and just building that physical and situational awareness. Um, And the other third could really just be that space in between, right? The space that during that session and just the emotions that we're talking about, the physical aspect, the mental component, all of that, I really like to call that the deep work. And that deep work is so critical for the things that we do, right? And that could come in a multitude of ways. That could come just through journey or that could come through just having a conversation. You know, I, I can give someone a technique to use and say, hey, I want you to do this Monday, Wednesday, Friday. But when the client that I'm working with really starts to dig into where that, you know, they have to figure out how that's going to work for them, right? So they have to figure out when they need it, why they need it, and what it's, you know, what purpose is it going to serve for them in the long run? Um, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Like that, that's a, that's a key part of this. Um, that deep work as you called it, uh, taking what it is that I've learned, uh, taking what, uh, has happened and transpired between me and a coach or, or me in a situation and digesting it, like literally Mm -hmm. like honing in on it, maybe even meditating on it. Um, I tend to do, uh, some some reflective thinking like each day mm-hmm. at the end of the day i try to think about that day and was i productive was i helpful did i serve somebody um all of those things are really important to me as a coach is like am i doing the right thing by the people that i'm working with and uh there's days where i go like yeah great job jim good job high fives there's other days where i'm like god i could have probably done a better job with that and not taking the time to reflect or think. I think there's a root cause for this. I, I think so many of us don't do this because you, you mentioned journaling a couple of different times now. And it's one of those things I know I should do. I know I'm better when I do it. But taking the time to do it, there's this, um, maybe this is one of those mental, psychological things. There's this dialogue going on in your head. Well, God, man, that journaling is going to take me 15 to 30 minutes. I could be so much more productive doing this thing that produces something um, that's either revenue generation or increase in athletic ability, like taking more uh, batting practice or running uh, more, practicing your start or whatever it may be, instead of taking the time to actually think about what it was that you did, uh, taking time to digest a little bit. Is that part of what you do as a coach? Like, how do you, how do you get people to actually do it? Because The world today is a world of absolute distraction 95% of the time. Like when I do a podcast, I have to like leave my phone in a different room. I have to turn off every other tab on my computer. I don't want any distraction. I want to be totally focused on you while I'm here. Mm -hmm. I think so many people have a hard time with that because of this um, constant need to be connected to everything else but ourselves. How do you help people like get to the point of actually understanding and doing that? I think we've already answered that question a little bit, Jim, in the sense of, you know, that wall that people experience, right? That mental wall with that script, because that's going to apply to the same situation. And one exercise I like to put some of my athletes in that really want to work on staying present under pressure is when we're talking just on a screen, I literally just have them take their thumb, put it on their knee for two minutes and just focus on solely that. Right. Well, that's you a long time to put your thumb on your knee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I bet most of you have a hard time doing that. 
Yeah. So, and they just have to see how long they can keep that focus on that sensation or that feeling as long as they can. And nine times out of 10, they can't focus for that full two minutes. So sometimes it's really just teaching them how to stay present and learn how to play the long game. Right. And sometimes we might just even do that practice for a while. Um, for sure. But so my, okay. So we say, all right, we're not being present. I've got this little drill is really what it is. Uh, I want you to just stick your thumb to your knee for two minutes and it gets super uncomfortable. I ha- I can imagine like me, I'm ADD and all that other stuff. I'm bouncing off the walls 90% of the time. And I'm very achiever focused. Um, I'm a competitive individual and to sit still for two minutes sounds like the craziest thing in the world. So I would assume most struggle with it. What are some of the steps they can take to get past that struggle? Are there the some drills? Are there some practice things? Sorry. Yeah. It's, no, you're okay. I think the the first step is like just acknowledging that it is uncomfortable. Right. We live in a world that is constantly distracting and always wants to pull our attention left and right. I'm the same way as you. And what's really important is just understanding that the world wants you to be in this state of instant gratification, whether it is in in and outside of life, but just learning how to be intentional. And I, I don't give what this really is. This drill is mindfulness training. And I don't like to give it that label. I really just call it, call it as it is just practicing stillness. And when people understand what that feels like to just incorporate and be intentional about building time to be still and away from the world, they find that they're able to just have a better relationship with, you know, their job, they're having a better relationship with exercise uh, because they, they take the time to really just be intentional and build that awareness around their thoughts and their feelings and, what really makes them uncomfortable Um, and and just learning how to be present in their own bodies and not checking out um, and just really staying still. And sometimes, you know, some people think of it as, you know, karate kid, chop wood, carry water, but it, it is pretty simple at the end of the day, the world just wants to pull your attention as hard as it can in the other direction. Boy, I, I could not agree more. <laughs> it's a it's a thing we all struggle with. I, I think everybody struggles with this. Um, I don't think it's uh, if they don't, they're an unusual bird. They live, they're a hermit somewhere. Just the world with and, and it's changed really in the last ten years with the social media and the mobile technology. Now we've got this AI thing going on. There's all this stuff to and then you take in division and politics, religion, and all that like. There's a billion pieces of information just pounding on us daily. And we're out there going, I got to get as much of it as I possibly can. Where the reality is, we should probably sit there for a second and go, why do I feel like that? Why am I, why am I feeling like I'm being left out, fear of missing out, all of that kind of stuff, if I don't do this stuff? And what can I actually do to it about it? Lean into it, own it a little bit, reflect on it, and then get focused back on what the I would say the priorities are like, what's the next most important thing that I could really do that would fulfill me, help others, serve others, build my business, help me run a faster race and and get really honed in on focusing on those smaller things that are right now and present instead of being focused on all that stuff that could be going on out there. Mm -hmm. Did I break that down? Okay. If I understood you correctly, that's what I'm getting from what you're talking about. Yeah. And I think one thing I could add in there is not even necessarily why, like, why am I having this feeling? Some people need to take a step farther back and say, what is this feeling? Right. Putting a label on that feeling and saying, you know, what, what is this? When do I feel it? What does it actually feel like in my body when I'm distracted or, you know, just trying to be distracted and not build intention or value into my business or my job or, you know, just being a better athlete. Right. And we talked about this before. I've really, what I'm teaching is life skills in a sports Jersey. Right. And I just, that. <laughs> <That's too great. laughs> well, I, I played sports. Like I said, I played sports for a long time and I've coached sports for 20, 25 years. I retired 10 years ago. 
from doing any of that. And I, and I look at what I'm doing now as a sport, I actually call our clients athletes. I call the salespeople uh, top reps. Like we we create this very athletic feel to what it is that we're doing here, which is why I wanted to talk to you because I think the two go hand in hand. Whenever I stopped being the athlete in sports, I started to be an athlete in business and really treating it the same way that there was a lot of discipline involved. There was a lot of hard work involved that whatever anybody else was willing to do, I would do a little bit more. I would be the first one in and the last one out. I would set the example for the rest of the team. And all of those things that uh, from a mental standpoint, take a lot of discipline to do. Um, mm-hmm. And I learned it from sports. I think we can take a lot of this mental performance stuff that you're talking about and really apply it to uh, what we do in business. And I, I kind of think you might be um, missing an opportunity. I think you have this opportunity that these entrepreneurs probably could use a lot of your help. How, how would they get a hold of you? Like if, in case there was somebody listening and said, what? now the other thing is a lot of these entrepreneurs that are listening to this, they are athletes. Um, whether they're endurance runners, like I got a buddy that does the whole 100 mile endurance race. I'm like, you're out of your mind. I can't imagine running 100 miles. Um, I got fikes, folks that are cyclists. I'm a cyclist. Uh, we have folks that are, uh, you know, the mud runs and that kind of stuff. We have all kinds of athletes that are in this world. And I think it's something that has to do with the two going very well together entrepreneur and sports. If somebody wanted to get a hold of you and talk with you more about, hey, is there a way that you can help me with what I'm dealing with mentally to break some barriers and get through? How would they get a hold of you? Yeah. So I do have a website. I don't update it as much as I should, but I do have a website and my contact info is on there. Um, really just the best way to get a hold of me is through email. It's just Ryan at perseveranceperformance.com. Website is literally just perseveranceperformance.com. Um, I'm, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. If anyone ever wants to connect with me on there, just, Try and have a conversation. You know, I, I'm open to even just starting and having like a 30 minute conversation with someone just for the heck of it and just saying, yeah, how could I help you? What are some skills that might be valuable for you that I can teach you over, you know, eight to 10 weeks? And let's see where we can go from there. Because I think even just in the last couple of weeks in the NBA, if you think of athletes that are going through, a variety of different things right now. If you think about Giannis, if you think about KD, you know, everyone that's in the finals right now and then postseason. The reality is you don't need to be a professional athlete for this stuff to work for you. And I would argue that it's more important for the 99% who don't have that physical ability to really start digging in and working on those different skills so that they can apply that and just make themselves better people. Right. At the end of the day, I'm just trying to help people have better relationships with themselves and performance, whether that's on top of a roof or that's, you know, out on a on a mountain somewhere going for 100 miles. So I think that, <laughs> I hope that answers. crazy. People. <laughs> uh, I got another buddy that does the mountain bike thing for 100 miles up a mountain. Like, it's just crazy. Oh um, <laughs> yeah, I just, <laughs> no thanks. Uh, <laughs> and like, there's several different races you got to do before that one, before you can even qualify for it. So it's a pretty intense thing. Ryan, this has been a great talk. Um, I, I think some of the takeaways are to uh, take some time to reflect a little bit, to journal, mm-hmm. uh, to dig into uh, what it is that um, it may be causing us to think the way we think. And actually owning it, not digging into the positive right way, but owning and and discovering what how it makes you actually feel. Well, are you fearful? Mm-hmm. Are you sad? Are you distressed? Is there anxiety? Like what what's actually happening to you? Because once we know what's happening to us, then we have a choice on what we're going to do with our reaction. Yeah. Absolutely. Man, this has been great. This has been fantastic, right? Yeah. Um I appreciate you being on the show today. Uh, we're up against the clock, so I don't want to keep you any more than I uh, promised with you. But uh, thanks for being on the show. Uh, we are going to include your information in the show notes. So those of you that are listening and watching, check out the show notes below, whether it's comments or discussion, where whatever uh, platform it may be on. And we'll have uh, perseveranceperformancecoaching.com on there, Ryan's email on there, uh, and Hey, sounds like he'll do a free 30 minute conversation with you. It might be worth it. Yep. One last thing. 
I love the name of the company, Perseverance Performance. Is there a reason you chose the word perseverance? Because it could have been like high performance or high octane or any of that kind of stuff. Like why perseverance? Yeah. So I, I think when I was <laughs> thinking of my name for, for my company, um, you know, I, I'm a pretty biblical and, you know, just kind of set my own biblical beliefs. Um, obviously, I know people have their own biases towards that. But when I was in college, one of our team verses that I got to pick out as a captain for the cross country team came from the book of James. And it, I think it was um, chapter two, verse three, where it was talking about the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And that's really what I do with athletes is I help them learn how to test their faith in you know their career or practice or whatever, so that they can start to build that perseverance, right? They are, they're able to build that physical resiliency and that mental resiliency to go after what they want to in life. So. To survive on this planet, we better know how to persevere. Nobody promised it was going to be easy. Um, I, I love the name. You're in a safe place here. James 2, uh, <laughs> verse 3. We're all good with that. Uh, we talk yeah. about that quite a bit on our show. I, our whole purpose, the reason we exist is to empower people to believe. Empower them to believe in themselves, to believe in us as their guide and coach, and to believe, hey, there's a higher power out there that has a, pl a plan for us. And to lean mm -hmm. into it, it's okay. Um, yeah. So you're, you're in a great place for that. I, I'm glad to hear <laughs> that. I'm glad we finished with that. Glad I asked that question. Yeah. Once again, Ryan, thanks for being on the show, man. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you for having me on, Jim. It's been super fun. It's been a blast. <laughs> yeah. I look forward to the future. Like, you know, maybe a couple of years from now, we uh, hop on again and we see uh, uh, Ryan's out there like coaching all these businesses and stuff on mental performance. That would be, uh, that would be pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, man. We'll let you go. Have a great one. Mm -hmm. All right, everybody. That was Ryan Tigan from Perseverance Performance. And I, I knew I wanted to have him on because those two things just relate so much. Sports and business. Uh, sports and really entrepreneur, like I'm going to start a business. And when we start a business, we got to start ground zero, right? Like we're, we're business licenses and all the things. And there's these steps we have to take. And if you play a sport, it's the same way. If you think about it, any of you that were, grew up playing sports, you didn't just walk out the very first day and decide to pick up a baseball bat and hit a home run. It was like a little soft toss here and there. There was a tee to hit off of. You had to have somebody show you how to swing. Um, and that's what coaches are for. They're there to help you get those fundamentals down, build on those skills, develop a strategy for how to handle is that you're dealing with or the goals that you want to achieve, and then be there with you to give you the advice and encouragement that you need along the way. It's what we do here at Contractor Coach Pro. We help contractors uh, with the sport of business. We, we help you guys get control of that business by leading it better with processes and systems and accountability so that it can then grow and then give you that thing you were hoping for whenever you started your business, which was personal and financial freedom for most of us to do what we want with who we want when we want. If that interests you and you'd like some help with it, go to our website, contractorcoachpro.com. Scroll down a little bit till you see take assessment and take the assessment that's on our website. It's no joke. It's 15, 20 minutes. So set some time aside, get all those distractions out of the way. Take the assessment. It's going to tell us the strengths and weaknesses of you and your business. If we get that, you're going to get a calendar link and you can pick a time that works for you. One of our coaches will hop on with you and we're going to know the two or three things that if you focused on those first and got those done, that would level you up to the next thing. And you would get a real coaching call, not a sales pitch or anything like that. If coaching seems like a good thing for you and you want to work with us, great. If not, we've still served you well, helping you get to those next steps in your business. That's what we're here to do. We're here to help you guys get better at what you do faster than you could on your own. Thanks for checking us out here on Contractor Radio. If you liked it, make sure you give us the like button, subscribe on YouTube comments if you have any down below we love to have interaction with you guys thanks for being here and we'll see you on our next episode